Welcome to English Plus Podcast, the English we speak, and much more. Learn English, expand your knowledge, and enjoy through our vocabulary builder, novel, grammar, series, word power, poetry, and literature episodes. All our episodes come with full transcripts, quizzes, downloadable worksheets, and more exclusive content you get only by listening to English Plus Podcast. Support English Plus Podcast by becoming a patron of the show on Patreon. Use the link in the description and become a patron of English Plus Podcast. There are many benefits to becoming a patron of our show, so what are you waiting for? Click the link and check them out on my Patreon page. But above all, support English Plus Podcast and help our free e-learning journey continue. Welcome to a new episode, and this happens to be the first episode in a series we are dedicating to mythology. And we will start with Greek mythology, maybe because it is the most famous or the most influential historically, but we will continue to talk about mythologies from all around the world. But our start is with Greek mythology. Now, we will talk in this episode about the Greek creation story. We will talk about the sources for Greek mythology and the nature of Greek myths. So, in everyday conversation, people often use the word myth to suggest that a story is untrue. But in our series, we will use myth to refer to a story that has meaning or significance beyond the story itself. And as we explore great myths from around the world, we will see that they are much more than just entertaining stories. These myths carried weight in their cultures by explaining the world and by investing everyday life with meaning. Today, thousands of years later, many of these myths still speak to universal human experience containing kernels of truth that seem to transcend space and time. And we will start with, as I said, Greek mythology, the most famous, the most influential mythology of all time. So, and where to start better than the Greek creation story? According to Greek mythology, in the beginning, out of a gaping abyss, three primordial elements emerged. Gaia, the earth, Tartarus, a cave-like space under the earth, and Eros, sexual desire. Other beings came forth from these primordial elements, including Uranus, the sky. Gaia and Uranus made it, producing the first generation of gods, and these were the Titans. Now, the Titans were physically imposing, very strong, and they were virtually immortal. But their father despised them. Uranus banished them to Tartarus as if he was trying to unbirth his own children. Cronos, one of Uranus's sons and the leader of the Titans, hated his father for this banishment, and with the help of his mother, Cronos attacked his father, cutting off Uranus's genitalia. After Cronos defeated his father, he settled down with Rhea, who was both his sister and his wife. The couple had several children, including the first generation of Olympian gods. And these were the most famous gods, the ones who would ultimately rule over Earth from Mount Olympus. Now, according to the Greek poet Hesiod, the period of Cronus' rule was the Golden Age, the time when the first race of humans was created. A race that predated ours. Of this Golden Age, Hesiod wrote, Men lived like gods, without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. When they died, it was as though they were overcome with sleep, and they had all good things. They dwelt in ease and peace. Of course, this perfect age couldn't last, as in all stories. Peace doesn't last for long. Perfect age didn't last in the origin story. Cronus worried that his children might do to him what he had done to his own father. And in an effort to avoid this fate, Cronus decided to eat his children. 
swallowing them one by one as they were born. But when the youngest child, Zeus, was born, Rhea decided to trick Kronos. She switched the baby with a stone, which Kronos swallowed without even noticing, and Rhea hid Zeus on the island of Crete until he grew up. When Zeus was grown, he returned home and forced Kronos to regurgitate his siblings. Then Zeus was joined by the other Olympic gods in an attack against Kronos and the other Titans, the Battle of the Titans, and that was between the Titans and the Olympian gods, and that lasted for ten years, with Zeus as the ultimate victor. After Zeus and the Olympians defeated the Titans, they forced the Titans underground, bound with chain in the same prison where Uranus had previously held them captive. Later, the Olympians also vanquished a race of giants that Gaia bore in an attempt to restore the Titans to power. But from that point forward, the Olympian gods ruled, having displaced the Titans forever. Now, how can we make sense of this myth? What kind of a worldview imagines fathers swallowing their children or banishing them to the bowels of the earth? And why tell stories about a former generation of gods a step removed from the Olympians. We don't have definitive answers to these questions. We don't know for sure. But we can draw at least two conclusions from these ancient stories. The first is that the stories depict a world of violence and hardship. To live was to experience suffering, but the response to suffering was important. And second, the stories tell us that the Greeks valued the skills and qualities that enabled them to triumph over violence, chaos, and aggression. In this light, the story of the Titans becomes a kind of cautionary tale for future generations. It's like telling the future generations that even the mighty can fall, sometimes at the hands of their own kin. It takes not only strength, but cunning and wisdom to survive. Now, some Greek thinkers drew direct connections between the Titans and humanity. Olympidorus argued that humanity arose from the ashes of the burning Titan corpses after their defeat. Other writers implied that humanity was born out of the bloodshed by the Titans in their war against Zeus. These perspectives suggest that humanity contains a titanic element that is at war with other elements within us. They also seem to place the Greeks in an uncertain relationship with the powerful yet capricious gods who ruled their world. And now, as this was the story of the creation, we will talk about the sources for Greek mythology and how we got it the way we have it today. Of course, when we talk about mythology, nothing is certain about the stories, but that doesn't matter. What really matters is the impact of these stories and the meanings of these stories that we have today. Like most stories. Because if you think about it, sometimes the origin of the story is not important and the story itself and how true the story is, is not important as long as it conveys a message or it tells us something. We learn something from it. Of course, we're not talking about news because in the news we have to be accurate and we just convey what really happened. But here we're talking about stories. In a way, it is literature. So, back to the sources for Greek mythology. The flowering of Greek mythology occurred during the Archaic and Classical periods from roughly 700 BCE to 323 BCE, when Alexander the Great died. Greece embraced poetry, epics, and theater, all of which included a heavy dose of mythology. From about 700 BCE on, Greece adopted the Phoenician alphabet and subsequently developed its own alphabet and began to keep written records. Around the same time, self-governing city-states began to establish themselves. Throughout this critical period, the people of the Greek city-states experienced several long, violent conflicts, particularly between about 500 and 323 BCE. Here, we see similarities between the Greeks' experience and the myths they tell about the first generation of gods. 
Probably the most famous author of Greek myths is Homer, who is generally credited with writing the Iliad and the Odyssey, epic poems focused on the Trojan War and its aftermath. There is considerable debate about whether Homer was a real person or whether he was a composite of several poets, and that really doesn't matter. Because again, maybe Homer was there, as I do believe he was a person, but maybe he wasn't. What really matters is the legacy we have, and we will talk about it as if Homer really existed. And if we assume that Homer really existed, he lived sometime in the 8th century BCE. Another important Greek author was Hesiod, who is usually dated to around 700 BCE. Now, the two complete poems of Hesiod we have are the Theogony, which describes the origins and activities of the gods, and the Works and Days, which focuses on the human world set against the theological backdrop of the Theogony. A group of later writings known as the Orphic Material includes poems and hymns dating from the end of the 6th century BCE through to the 5th century CE. Orphic material is traditionally attributed to a mythical poet named Orpheus. But of course, it is believed that multiple authors wrote under this pseudonym, which was very common back in the day. Some writers would present their writing under the umbrella of a famous name so that they would assure their work would get exposure. Now, Orphic material has a dark note to it, at least a note of strangeness. It probably grew out of an idiosyncratic religious community dedicated to the worship of Orpheus, a hero with superhuman musical talents who tried to rescue his wife from the underworld. Orphic material often includes writings that are not found in Homer or Hesiod and sometimes present different versions of stories told elsewhere. Now, in addition to written sources, we also find references to Greek mythology on ancient artifacts and architecture. For example, images from Greek mythology are often found on vases, plates, bowls, and jewelry. Public buildings such as temples told the sacred stories of Greek culture on friezes, metopes, and altars. Now, of course, we have a lot of sources to Greek mythology, and it comes from everywhere, but these are the main sources for the stories that we talk about and we brand as Greek mythology. And now what about the nature of Greek myths? Now, the various sources we have on Greek mythology and history allow us to make several broad generalizations about the nature of Greek myth. First, Greek myth reflects the world in which it originated, and a key aspect of this world is that it was local. Now, we tend to think of ancient Greek culture as growing out of one homogenous nation, but that wasn't the case. The ancient Greeks didn't think of themselves as Greeks at all, but as affiliated with a particular city-state such as Athens or Sparta. Such loyalties were so strong that city-states sometimes developed bitter rivalries with each other that occasionally erupted into war. Many of the myths now associated with important Greek gods and heroes probably originated as individual stories that were first created in specific cities and regions. But over time, as traders traveled, communities migrated, and various empires achieved conquest, individual tales and story clusters were shared and adapted. For example, many of the labors of Heracles are linked to specific places. It is possible that several of the Heracles stories originated as stories about local heroes, but as the Heracles oral tradition spread, it absorbed these local stories and replaced the local hero with Heracles. And this phenomenon is common in oral traditions. In addition to reflecting local identity, Greek mythology was meant to be instructive. The Greek myths include basic stories about the natural world and man's relationship to it. For example, the Titans represented forces of nature, the wind, the sea, and storms, and the defeat of the Titans mythologized humanity's ability to harness these forces. 
Greek myth also taught geography. The Odyssey, for example, offers a tour of the known world through Odysseus's travels. Greek mythology set the stage for a human endeavor. It explained in story form the world in which the ancient Greeks understood they had been born, a world with natural, social, moral, and cosmic components in conflict with one another. But as we will see, it also speaks to modern audiences by issuing a kind of existential declaration. Human beings are not handed a blank slate. Instead, humanity steps into the second act of a play already in progress, with no scripts or clear stage directions. It's up to humans to negotiate the various plots already underway and to figure out how to proceed. The various Greek mythological figures, gods, heroes, and mythical creatures provide advice and limited assistance, but they do not control the outcome and in any case may or may not want to help. We'll also see that other cultures present alternative existential views. One benefit of learning about many great mythologies together is that they invite us to compare how different cultures have positioned humanity in the cosmos. And finally, myths provide guidance. Their explanations are never primarily informational. They are meant to be transformational. We are meant to change how we live in light of the myths of our own culture. We think and act in certain ways based on how we are oriented to our fundamental life circumstances. Myth provides this orientation. It guides our choices by telling us where we belong in the cosmos and in society. Myths explain the nature of life and death, the nature of true love, even the nature of a well-lived life. So, that was the first part in our long series where we're going to talk about mythologies from around the world. We talked about the Titans, the story of creation, the sources for Greek mythology, and the nature of Greek mythology. I hope you found the content of this series useful, and I want you to stick around because more will come your way. Every week we will have a mythology episode, and we will continue talking about mythologies from all around the world. Don't forget that you can get the transcript of this episode by using the link we provide in the description, and there's also this short quiz that you can use to check your understanding of the things we talked about in this episode. And one last thing, don't forget to support our show by becoming our patron on Patreon to help us create even more free e-learning content. This was your host, Danny, saying thank you very much for listening to our episode today, and I will see you next time. Thank you.